day. So, today we will be talking about local internet working. So, on the, our topic of today is local internet working. What is internet working? Internet working is connection of different networks. Well, we are everybody is uh, uh, aware of the term internet today, it really comes from this term internet working. And by internet working, we means connecting different networks. Just to remind you, what is a network? Well, uh, we uh, discussed this in the last lecture that inter the interconnected nodes in the same broadcast domains okay. and networks are usually connected through routers, but as we will see for local internet networking, we may uh, not need a router, we may need something called a bridge, we will come to that. So, uh, this is the set of nodes which are in the same broadcast domain. Now, this broadcast may be a good thing to have for some application. But for the operation of the network, there is one very crucial uh, reason why we require the broadcast that is to discover the MAC addresses of the different computers. Okay. So, you can send an ARP message uh, <coughs> as we have seen. So, we will just look at that now once again. So, if you can send an ARP message and get the MAC uh, the, uh, which uh, where you will give the IP address that means you are basically asking the question that who what is the MAC address of the machine whose IP address is this okay? and now then that machine will reply with its own uh, MAC address. That MAC address has to be put in the destination address of the data link layer frame. So, that is how it operates in a single network. If you have two networks which are connected to each other, uh, um, then first of all um, I mean you may require this for so many reasons two or more networks to be managed as a single network that could be one advantage of interconnection. One type of computer to communicate with another that is another electronic mail etcetera going across the networks that is that might happen. Now, if you have uh, uh, two networks connected there may be multiple routes between nodes which help to create alternative communication routes when links either are not operating or if they are busy. To have the capacity to isolate traffic from other networks. Now, this is one important reason for our uh, local internet working which is that as we have seen that uh, if, if you want to um, um, find the MAC address you send an ARP broadcast. Okay. But if the uh, uh, network is so large uh, then so many people will be broadcasting and the broadcasting load on the entire network will become very heavy. Okay. So, at uh, as the NAS network grows as more and more nodes more and more computers get connected to the network at some point of time you will have to decide that okay, no the performance is really getting degraded because so many nodes are sending broadcast messages. So, I have to break it up the network although then that network may be may be in the same building. But even then we may like to if there are too many uh, nodes connected to it we may like to break it up. So, so that the scope of broadcast becomes limited. To have the capacity to isolate traffic from other networks mainly we are talking about broadcast traffic and access to information on remote sites. So, these are the advantages of connecting networks. Now, look at this problem which we had uh, just uh, uh, very <coughs> briefly glimpsed earlier that is we will uh, uh, walk through on uh, this uh, this is suppose there is this node a which wants to uh, send a message to a node b uh, a knows b's ip address but they are in two different lands which are separated but nevertheless they are connected through a router of course you have to have some physical connection and as well as we will see that some kind of network device over here so that two different lands can communicate with each other so, now uh, what uh, actually this router uh, and we will see there later on that the same thing applies to bridges also uh, when we come to bridges. Uh, we will uh, come to the basics of router and uh, what it contains all the details etcetera uh, later on uh, when we discuss the uh, network layer. But right now we will just uh, talk about the ARP and the MAC layer. So, let us say that there are there must be two ARP tables in router R, one for this LAN, another for this LAN. Okay. Uh, so, there are two ARP tables in router 1, one for each IP network. In routing table at source host, find router. So, now first of all, the host must find the router. Now, for finding the router, 
it once again must know the uh, MAC address which is given over here as something like E5, E9, etc. whatever it is uh, does not make too much sense to human beings. It is just a bunch of uh, 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 bytes, 6 bytes actually. So, the, the host uh, that means the A has to know the router in order to send it to the and in order to send it because in order to send it to B or in order to even uh, know the address of B the A must um, somehow communicate with the router and for communicating with the router uh, it may know the router's IP address, but finally this hardware adapter to these two hardware adapters they have to communicate. So, they have to know each other's hardware address or MAC address. So, what it will do is that it will find the so in the ARP table at source find MAC address. So, uh, I mean it may have already communicated with the router. So, it may already be in its ARP table if it is not then of course, it will uh, do an ARP and find out. So, you will find the uh, MAC address of the this ad adapter of the router. Then A creates a datagram with source A and destination B. Uh, what do we mean by source A and destination B? We are talking about uh, here the, about the uh, IP address of B and uh, the IP address of A that is the network layer address which will all be in the packet uh, which is coming down from the network layer. A uses ARP to get R's MAC address for this. A creates link layer frame with R's MAC address as destination. Frame contains A to B IP datagram. A's data link layer sends the frame. Now, R's data link layer will receive this frame uh, on the that particular adapter. R removes IP datagram from Ethernet frame sees that it is destined to B. So, now it has stripped off that data link layer header and trailer and see that find that this is destined to B, uh, which by looking at the IP address the router would know that is not in LAN 1, but in LAN 2. So, R uses ARP to get R B's physical layer address. Now, R through the other adapter must communicate with the LAN 2 and specifically to B. For that it has to know B's uh, um, address. So, for that it does a ARP in LAN 2 and then R creates a frame containing A to B IP datagram and sends it to B. So, this is the so, so A communicates with with B. So, the original packet contains the source IP address as this Maybe this is the IP address of A uh, and maybe this is the IP address of B this is just for example. So, uh, <coughs> these numbers do not matter. So, there is 4 byte IP address and then that datagram is sent with A's source MAC address routers this adapters uh, MAC address as the destination router gets it does an ARP in LAN 2 find out finds out the MAC address which is this 449 BD etcetera uh, from the through the ARP then forms a date frame over here which contains the original packet which was sent by A's uh, network layer, but now it has the source as this adapter MAC address of the router and this host this MAC address as the destination and then it sends through the uh, LAN. So, this is how the whole scheme works. Just a couple of other slides for finishing off this ARP that when sending an ARP request the sender includes its own binding that means its own IP address and MAC address. So, all machines in the local network can extract the bindings from the ARP traffic and store it in its cache. Remember all other nodes do not have anything to do with this ARP, but still they listen to this ARP traffic which is going on and whatever bindings it can it sort of extracts and puts it in its cache. So, that if in the this particular that particular machine now wants to uh, communicate with any one of those then it can uh, it may bypass the ARP and get it straight away from the ARP cache. So, rather than doing a broadcast on the network again. So, system can notify others of its address by sending an ARP when it boots that is also this thing when it boots it sends uh, by sending an ARP uh, it can uh, sort of notify others of its address because it includes its own binding in the ARP uh, message. ARP is a low level protocol that hides the underlying networks physical addressing permitting one to assign arbitrary IP address to every machine. We think of ARP as a part of the physical network system and not as part of IP. So, ARP has to do more with the data link layer rather than the network layer. So, that is why we have talked about it now. Other protocols which has to do predominantly with the IP address we will talk about them 
later on after we discuss the network layer. To accommodate various systems ARP uses variable length packets because they are, this ARP may be used in various different networks. So, this is just part of our um, ARP message format. Um, uh, so, it uh, uh, once again uh, this is just a part there are other parts of it. Uh, once again you need not possibly uh, remember everything, but just know what kind of things are there hardware type 2 bytes. For example, for ethernet you will get a value of 1 protocol types 2 bytes 0800 for IP. Uh, H length that means the hardware address length as I mentioned that ARP may be used in various networks and various networks may have different classes of hardware addresses which are of varying length. If it is uh, the just the uh, ethernet address there will be 6 byte, but for other kinds of networks it may be something different. So, hardware address length is uh, uh, mentioned here in 1 byte, protocol address sorry length is uh, mentioned in 1 byte, operation uh, is uh, 2 bytes uh, of ARP. So, operates could be ARP request, ARP response, RARP we will tell you what RARP is request response etcetera. There are uh, some other fields in the some other possibilities in the ARP message. What is RARP? RARP stands for reverse ARP, reverse ARP. So, what was ARP? ARP is that I want to know the MAC address of the, the machine having this particular IP address. Okay. Now, RARP is somehow the reverse, okay. this is the MAC address, what is the IP address? Now, where, why will I ever require that? Uh, because uh, <coughs> well, I may require that for knowing my own IP address. When that will happen? When I uh, my IP address, I cannot store my IP address locally and specifically one uh, place where it is uh, uh, um, quite often used is in diskless machines. You know, so nowadays there is this concept of uh, diskless machines, uh, or they are also known as thin clients, which really uh, use the computational power and the disk storage, etc., of a central server. Okay, the idea is that uh, these uh, thin clients, since they are they have minimal functionality, they are uh, easier to maintain, and they may be a little cheaper and things like that. And as you upgrade, it is easier to upgrade one central server rather than a whole bunch of PCs. So if you have a thin client and a server, so that is the idea. But then when this thin client comes up and the thin client and the server of course, uh, communicates over a network okay? usually uh, may be with an uh, in an IP network. But for communicating for being an entity in the IP network you must have an IP address. Now, how will this IP address be stored? This diskless machine does not have any um, disk, so to store anything permanently. So, whenever you switch it off it is all volatile except for the small ROM uh, everything is volatile. So, when it boots up tries to boot up it has a small uh, program in its <coughs> ROM or somewhere uh, which can do some elementary processing. It can find out its own MAC address because it is just local and then give that uh, uh, MAC address with an RARP asking for the uh, for its own IP address. What the server will do is that server will assign an IP address to it. So, used by district machines to get IP addresses which may be in a server like ARP, RARP is also sent in the data portion of the frame. The frame type contains 8035, the data portion contains 28 octets. There may be primary and backup RARP servers and then there are two other the protocols like boot P and DHCP which are more in the have to do with the network layer. So, we will talk about boot P and DHCP uh, later on when we talk about uh, other TCP IP protocol suits uh, which are successors to RARP. Okay. Now, uh, we have uh, just seen how uh, what is internet working that means connecting two different networks together. If this internet working is local okay, that means uh, just may be uh, in the same organization may be in the same building or uh, I mean very close buildings etcetera may be in the same campus. Uh, then uh, for the networking part you may not require uh, the full power of a router. Okay. You may do it with a data link layer device called a bridge. We will be discussing about bridges today. So, bridges well uh, it can connect different networks. As a matter of fact, it can connect different networks of different types for example, 802.x to 802.y. 
So, uh, these x and y may have the same value both of them may be 3 that is both of them may be ethernets or uh, a 1 may be ethernet the other may be uh, may be token ring or something. Locally connect small lands this small is important because if it is big uh, then uh, bridges cannot handle this any longer. It is a data link layer device and uh, it follows a protocol in I from IEEE 802.1 which is a spanning tree of bridges. If you remember how these uh, IEEE 802 protocols are organized, 802.1 we sort of put it at the top uh, gives an overview and a few things which are generally applicable to all the, uh, um, all the layers then 802.2 was your uh, link layer <coughs> etcetera and 802.3 was Ethernet 4 per token pass token ring etcetera etcetera. So, those were there. So, we will look at some more 802 uh, protocols uh, when we discuss. Uh, our um, wireless networks. Anyway, but 802.1 now a bridge may connect different types of networks. So, that is why it is put in 802.1 and this has a this uses a spanning tree protocol we will discuss the spanning tree protocol <coughs> presently. So, a local internet network a picture would lose, uh, look something like this suppose this is a LAN 1, this is LAN 2, this is LAN 3 and this is LAN 4. So, there are 4 LANs which are connected by 2 bridges. This bridge has 2 uh, ports one connecting to this LAN 1 the other to LAN 2. This bridge has got 3 ports one connecting to LAN 2, 3 and 4. So, now uh, A for example, can now communicate with H through 2 bridges. <coughs> okay. So, uh, just the salient points about the bridges first of all it is a link layer device stores and forwards ethernet frames which means that it has to do with the MAC address rather than the IP address. So, this uh, bridges handle the uh, hardware addresses straight away. It examines frame headers and selectively forwards frames based on MAC destination address which means that uh, let us say in the previous uh, diagram when um, B2 uh, this bridge uh, gets something from uh, a frame from here it will look at the hardware address and really decide whether to send it to LAN 4 or to LAN 3. So, it selectively would uh, send it to one of them all right. When frame is to be forwarded on segment uses CSMA CD to access the segment. So, <coughs> that is the protocol it is transparent that means, hosts are unaware of presence of bridges. So, to the host actually the whole thing might look like one single uh, network all right. Uh, so, that is uh, so that is one good thing that it is uh, transparent. So, you do not have to just uh, if you have a router uh, you will have to uh, sort of um, um, try to um, I mean just uh, get the routers address uh, the and uh, use it as something maybe for some configuration etcetera. But uh, bridges are transparent people do not really bother about bridges they are there they perform their function well which is main function as I said that, that one of the reasons why you would not uh, why you might like to break up a big network into smaller network is to contain the broadcast storm. Okay. <coughs> so, they are transparent they are plug and play that means, you can just put it in it will do some self learning and start operating. In the beginning of the self learning phase when it has not learned enough uh, it may be a little inefficient later on its efficiency will improve as it learns more. So, bridges do not need to be configured which is another great thing. A bridge separates lands if you want each groups traffic to remain within its own LAN. So, there may be other reasons for, for us to uh, want the traffic to remain within uh, my own LAN there may be some security issues there may be all kinds of other issues. At the physical level the bridge boosts the signal strength like a repeater or a completely regenerates the signal. So, just as like a hub or a switch uh, uh, um, before forwarding it it will uh, sort of uh, boost up the signal that means it or regenerate the signal. Uh, so, which is also a good thing bridges usually use the same protocol on either side for example, ethernet to eth uh, ethernet or token ring to token ring. They may also convert between protocols for example, ethernet to token ring. Bridges are fine for medium sized organizations, but are totally inadequate for large installations they would require routers. A bridge stores the hardware addresses observed from the frames received by each interface and uses this information to learn which frames need to be forwarded by the bridge. 
So, what the bridge will do is that it will maintain a table in itself uh, and in for each of these interfaces and in that table it will uh, store all the hardware addresses it has seen in this segment. So, it will know that these machines are in this segment and these machines are in this segment. So, if from LAN A it uh, uh, gets a packet uh, which is uh, which really has a um, hardware address for a machine in LAN B. So, it will send it to LAN B. Okay. So, we have this, uh, this is uh, uh, some more details that means, we have the physical interfaces, the data link layer, then we have the address table, the filter table, how we will filter it before forwarding uh, and then maybe another address table for this uh, interface. So, uses this information to learn which frames need to be forwarded by the bridge. So, this is just an, uh, another example of a picture, nothing there. So, bridges forward a packet only to the segment where destination host is connected to. Bridges can construct or learn forwarding table from the source address of the packets it has recently forwarded. So, a, and a, of course, whenever there is an ARP on that side of the LAN, uh, the bridge uh, that port will also get that ARP request. So, it will uh, find out some of the bindings and it can uh, sort of uh, quickly learn and fill up its table. What if a host is moved to another segment or what if a new host is connected to a segment? Well, if a new host is connected to a segment which means that your this learning business is going to be um, going, going to be a continuous process and what happens uh, that if you move uh, suppose you have moved it from LAN 1 to LAN 2 one, uh, one machine. So, naturally that is adapter that network interface card goes along with the machine from LAN 1 to LAN 2. Now, although people used to think or uh, specifically in the bridges router table is there that this particular MAC address is in LAN 1, but in the meanwhile the, that uh, particular MAC address has now moved to LAN 2, which means that these table entries must have some time to leave. So, after some time it must sort of uh, die out, uh, uh, so that uh, it be remains uh, the data which is there is remains fresh and relevant. So, there may be uh, uh, so a large number, so here from A through K, uh, we have so many these green ones are the different LAN segments and this B1, B2 to B7, these are 7 bridges and they are connecting multiple uh, LANs, all right. Mm, of course, trying to connect, you can connect multiple LANs like this, but it might have a problem. The problem is uh, that mm, you might uh, sort of, uh, you might get into a loop and how to avoid that, that we will discuss. So, for increased reliability, it is desirable to have redundant alternative paths from source to destination. With multiple paths, cycles result. So, bridges may multiply and uh, forward frames forever. So, it may go on and on and on without the frame ever getting dropped because uh, in the bridge and in the data link layer, uh, there is no concept of that that this uh, particular frame uh, has been moving around for a long time. Okay. There is no uh, way to uh, handle that. So, we do that in IP layers in some way. So, we will talk about that later on. So, once a um, frame starts circulating, uh, that means, uh, in a going in a cycle, it will go on and on. So, it is going to stay there uh, and go on and on. All right, and uh, such uh, frames may actually increase in numbers and then bring down the whole network. So, that is not acceptable. So, what we do is <coughs> solution is to organize bridges in a spanning tree by dissembling subset of interfaces. So, some of the subs, uh, some of the interfaces we willfully disable in the sense that we do not use them. So, suppose you have uh, something like this, obviously there could be cycles over here, but if you disable this interface of the bridge and if you disable this interface of the bridge, then what will happen is that uh, now you do not no longer have a uh, no longer have a cycle, you have this, 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 these are the only three um, paths, so you cannot have a cycle, all right. So, uh, we can think of the extended LAN as a graph nodes are the LAN segment. So, each LAN segment becomes a node uh, So and, and the bridges of course, are again nodes. Edges are bridge to segment links. So, this is how if you create a graph. So, construct a tree from the original graph 
creeping all segment nodes, but possibly removing some bridge nodes and edges. Okay. Just think about this that the specifically the bridges and the individual land segments uh, they are the nodes. All right. So, with all these nodes and for the bridge to the land uh, that connection we form an edge. Now, this graph may have cycles we remove the uh, we remove the cycles uh, minimally in the sense that by still keeping the graph connected. Okay. If the original graph is not connected that means, it is not possible to go from some node to some other node then in the original um, uh, I mean diagram there is uh, there is no physical connection. So, you cannot do anything about it, but if the original one was connected when we disable some of the links we still keep it connected, but we keep it minimally connected in the sense. Uh, so, and all the nodes are retained. So, that is why it is a spanning tree. So, finally, what we want to do is that we want to have a spanning tree with some of the edges disabled. Okay. So, uh, so, this is an example graph in A, uh, we have a graph with lots of cycles. What we do is that we remove some of the edges, so that the graph still remains connected. It is still possible to go from any node to any other node, but there is no cycle in this graph. All right. So, that is a spanning tree. So, all the nodes are still connected, but uh, there is no cycle. So, for this we use a spanning tree algorithm uh, for this is IEEE 802.1. Uh, so, basic idea is each bridge decides which ports it should forward packets to, so that the resulting network is acyclic. Resulting network interconnects all segments. Assume each bridge has a unique ID and of course, it knows its own ID this you will have to assume for the algorithm. Bridge with the smallest ID is the root bridge, root bridge forwards packets to all its ports. Non root bridges compute shortest path to root, but how? The point is uh, you will remember in this as well as in some uh, many other network algorithms as we will see that these algorithms are distributed algorithms in the sense that each of the nodes does some computation locally using locally available knowledge. Now, that locally available knowledge may not be consistent uh, if you see the global picture, okay. but the global picture is not known, okay. only the local things are known. So, that is why you have to use instead of a centralized algorithm, sometimes we do use centralized algorithm gather all the information together in one place and do then do the computation. Centralized algorithms, the uh, traditional algorithms that you do in computer courses and they are obviously easier. So, it is a little bit more difficult to write distributed algorithms, but here you do not have any option you have to write a distributed algorithm. You can do a node or a bridge in this particular case can do the computation only based on what it knows locally. Okay. It does not have the global picture, it tries to form a global picture and that is the uh, crux of the algorithm how to form that global picture. So, each LAN has a single designated bridge, bridge closest to root uh, <coughs> and tie breaker is that minimum bridge ID. So, all packets of a LAN are forwarded only to that LAN's designated bridge. So, this is the algorithm in short, now let us get a look into it in details. What it does is that bridges exchange configuration messages to determine spanning tree in a distributed manner. How does it does that? No, what does a configuration message cons consist of? The CM, the configuration message consists of three things S, R and H, where S is the bridge ID of the messages sender that is the sources bridge ID, R is the bridge ID for the assumed route. That means, whoever is sending this CM whatever he knows about the route, uh, whatever he thinks is the best value for the route uh, that is what he uh, sends as the root uh, bridge ID and H is the distance in hops from messages sender to the assumed root. Okay. So, H is the distance from R to S as is known to this particular bridge. So, C M gives three things S, R and H bridge ID, the root ID and the distance from the root to that particular sender. Now, two C M's we say that C M 1 is better than C M 2 that means, uh, one configuration message is uh, uh, message 1 is better than the configuration message 2 if C M 1 identifies root with smaller bridge ID. So, this must be originating from somewhere closer to the root that is the idea. So, C M 1 identifies root with smaller bridge ID. 
Now, if both the CMs uh, give the same uh, uh, root ID that means, so you cannot uh, say which one is better based on this, but CM1 is closer to root you remember we are giving the distance also that h. So, if C m 1 is closer to root then C m 1 is better than C m 2 or both C m's identify same root and distance to the root, but C m 1 sender has smaller bridge id. In that case C m 1 is preferred. So, initially all bridges assume that they are root and generate CMs. So, what they will do is that uh, as the algorithm starts everybody will assume that okay, I am the root and since I am the root it is my responsibility to send initiate CMs to all the um, nodes which are uh, sort of uh, uh, which are my neighbors. Okay. So, that is how it will start. Each bridge remembers the best CM it has received or sent. And in general, so with time what will happen is that if you just uh, look at this with time it will identify the root because smaller and smaller roots will keep coming to it and then finally, it will get the this smallest root and that is the one it will hold on to as the uh, best CM. Given that the value of the root is the same it will find that particular uh, direction in which uh, uh, it can reach the uh, root with the smallest number of hops. Okay. So, that is again a part of it. So, each bridge remembers best CM it has received or sent. Bridges use best CM to determine true root and to compute distance to root A. So, bridge stops generating CMs when it realizes that it is not the root. So, it stops uh, generating CM, but it will still forward CMs. After that point, it simply forwards all CMs it receives. So, a bridge stops forwarding CMs to a segment when it receives better CM from that segment. Suppose, a bridge was uh, um, the point is that a bridge uh, was sending some CM with maybe some particular route. Now, from some other through some other segment uh, uh, CM has come uh, which shows a better route. So, the better uh, route and the path to that better route must be through that segment. If that is so, then if you are sending again other forwarding messages there, so that is uh, not necessary. So, that uh, segment uh, will not get CMs uh, forwarded from this particular bridge. So, this is how it happened. Now, where does this algorithm converge to? Well, let us look at this once again. Uh, I mean, I will not uh, try to do a detailed uh, walk through for this, but uh, what we will do is that um, let us say this B1 will send CMs to B2, B6, B4 and B7 uh, and that is where it will go. So, it will go to this and this. B5 will also send etcetera, etcetera. Now, B1 uh, when B5 gets a message from B1 it knows that the B1 is on this side. So, it will stop sending on this segment. B7 will of course, send about B1 to B5, but then this is one hop away and this is one hop. So, this is two hops away. So, B5 will not only know that B1 is there, but it will know that this is the shortest route etcetera. For B3 it will get it from through either B5 or to through B2 whichever comes first. So, it will find that it is a hop to the root is B1, it will know, know that B1 is the root and then uh, maybe one of these is the earliest one. Uh, so, the other one would be uh, so uh, sorry this is B 2 and this is B 5 out of this B 2 is smaller than B 5 I am assuming that B 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 they are in the lexical order. Uh, so, it will connect to B 2 rather than this. So, it is going to uh, so that is how this will they will all come to know about the root very quickly although they may initially have thought of itself as a root, uh, but then uh, at some particular point of time for example, for B 3 it originally assumed that this is the root. Then it got a CM from B2 uh, saying that B2 is also thinking that I am the root. So, B2 will send. B3 will now know that there is somebody who is smaller than me. So, B2 must be the root. So, it will latch on to B2. But after some time B1 I mean after next just at the next iteration B2 will of course, by that time have got the CM from B1 and know that B1 is the root. So, it will forward this CM as B1 as the root to B3 with its own distance to B1. So, which is 1. So, this will have another get other one added to that. Now, B 3 will know that B 1 is the root. So, this way very quickly all the bridges will come to know about the root and they will latch on to the path to the root uh, which goes through the uh, smallest uh, 
numbered possible parent. For example, B3 could have go through B5 or B2, it would choose B2. So, that way we will finally have a tree. Okay. So, that is why the algorithm will converge to a tree uh, that connects all segments. Now, what if the root fails or what if the designated bridge of a land fails? That might happen, all right. So, some of it might fail, which means that. Uh, you cannot just run it once and then forget about it. From time to time, you have to run this spanning tree algorithm. Okay. Now, uh, when we discussed bridges, that is the uh, spanning tree algorithm. Um, one of the one of its uh, uh, utility is to isolate traffic, specifically broadcast traffic. So, bridge installation breaks LAN into LAN segments and bridges filter packet. Same LAN segment frames are not usually forwarded on to other LAN segments and segments become separate collision domain. So, this becomes one collision domain, this becomes another collision domain. So, because any broadcast over here is just limited here, any broadcast over here is just limited here. So, this is a, so this was a full LAN one IP network, but this is a LAN segment and this is another LAN segment which are bridged over here, all right. <coughs> so, these may be hubs, hosts, etcetera, etcetera inside. So, um, so how does it know uh, which uh, LAN segment to forward a, I mean when it gets a, when a bridge gets a frame, how does it know that where to forward it? Well, a bridge has a bridge table. Um, so, entry in the bridge table would be node LAN address, bridge interface and timestamp. So, the uh, uh, node LAN address that is that, that MAC address and the bridge interface to which it belongs uh, to the group to which it belongs that would be there. Also a timestamp in the sense that if it becomes too old then I want to drop this bridge entry from the bridge table. Stale entries in table dropped. So, time to leave can be 60 minutes this can be configured. Bridges learn which hosts can be reached through which interface. So, as it uh, listens to the traffic when frame received bridge learns location of sender incoming LAN segment, record sender location pair in bridge table. So, when bridge receives a frame index bridge table using MAC destination address, if entry found for destination then if the destination and segment from which frame arrived then drop the frame, because if the uh, frame is already uh, in that particular LAN. So, it has got nothing to do, so it drops the frame. Else, if it has to go to some other LAN, then it will forward it. So, this is what uh, selective forwarding is. Then, if it is, if this packet uh, frame is meant for some other LAN, then it will forward it to that particular interface. But it may so happen that it does not have. So, if a new machine is connected to the LAN, etc., or if the bridge has been newly connected, its uh, bridge table may not have uh, been constructed fully. So, it may not have an entry for this particular MAC address. So, else it will flood. By flood, we mean forward on all but the interface on which the frame arrived. So, this particular frame arrived from some interface uh, for some destination MAC address. The bridge does not know uh, to which LAN segment this MAC address belongs because this does not have a corresponding entry in the uh, bridge table. So, what it will do is that accepting that particular segment from which that frame originally came. Uh, it to all the other interfaces it will simply uh, flood it that means put in a copy of that to each of the other interfaces. So, in this particular case as I said that a bridge is when newly put in a network uh, in the beginning it will be inefficient because now it is sort of flooding uh, many packets to many segments, but as it slowly learns this will become more and more efficient. So, suppose C this sends a frame to D, okay. D replies back with a frame to C and suppose bridge has got this address table say A within port 1, B in port 1 etcetera, E in port 2, H in port uh, 3 maybe H in port 3, J in port 3 that is all it knows. So, it does not know about either C or D, bridge receives frame from C. 
So, bridge will receive the frame from C because C wants to talk to D. Uh, uh, notes in bridge table that C is on interface 1. So, this bridge table will get updated because C's sender's uh, MAC address would be there. So, C is in port 1 that is something it will uh, put in its MAC table, but of course, it does not know where D is. So, it will uh, is the it sends the frame into interfaces 2 and 3 that means, this is the port through which that is frame from C had come in. So, instead of this I mean accepting this particular LAN segment to all the other segments that is to all the other ports 2 and 3 it copies the frame. Naturally, so if, if, if it goes to 3 this is not uh, I mean D is not here. So, all these uh, hosts will ignore that frame whereas, here D will receive it. So, after D is received it now D will try reply back to C what will happen is now, now do you will send it to C, mm. D generates a frame for C, bridge receives frame, uh, bridge will receive the frame, one notes in bridge table that D is on interface 2. So, when it gets the this thing from this interface to so D, now C originally was uh, entered into the uh, table, now D is also entered uh, in the table. Bridge already now knows that C is on interface 1. So, it selectively sends it to interface 1 and it does not give it to interface 3 any longer. Okay. Now, when we are sort of having LANs uh, and as we know that LANs when they get bigger and bigger we have to at some point of time we have to decide that uh, I mean this cannot uh, really exist as one single uh, uh, collision domain. So, we have to segment it, we have to break it up into segments and bridge is one way to do it. So, we are sort of trying to get into bigger and bigger lands. So, this could be as is shown over here, this could be one way of uh, sort of segmenting some of the lands, maybe there is a hub over here uh, in some work group another hub, another hub we can connect them through bridge as well. Uh, up to now whatever we know this is correct and uh, th uh, this would work, but this is not very recommended for two reasons. First of all single point of failure at computer science hub, if this hub goes uh, these two cannot communicate with each other and all traffic between EE and AC that is the electrical engineering and system engineering must pass through CS which is also not a good thing to happen, I mean wh why should it. So, a recommended uh, configuration would be something like this that a bridge over here uh, uh, a hub a hub. Well, if uh, nowadays of course, you will not use a hub any longer. So, you will use a switch over here, switch over here, switch over here and maybe a switch or a bridge over here. So, this is a, so here we have a backbone. Okay, this is, so, this is the backbone switch or backbone bridge uh, and these are all connected to the backbone. So, if now EE wants to co communicate with AC, it goes through the backbone. <coughs> okay. Now, some of the bridge features is that it isolates collision domains, we have uh, talked about it resulting in higher total maximum throughput because uh, in a collision domain uh, and with a lot of broadcast traffic your net throughput of the network will go down. So, if you can sort of make it smaller etcetera, uh, so only that which needs to go to other segments will travel from one to the other. So, naturally the overall throughput of the network will increase. Limitless number of nodes and geographical coverage the same thing that happens with switches will also happen with bridges can connect different network types. Uh, uh, that is and again an advantage if you do have different network types and transparent plug and play no configuration is necessary it all sort of does some self learning. So, we have actually now seen, uh, so we are uh, jumping our gun a little bit in the sense that we are now just comparing a bridge with a router. Uh, because although uh, a router is a network level layer device and we have not talked about network layer as it is as yet. So, we will do that, uh, but uh, this much I mentioned that a router is used for connecting two different networks. Similarly, I also said that bridge is used for connecting two different networks. Well, bridge is usually used in uh, local internet networking rather than global internet networking. Global internet networking you definitely need routers and what they do etcetera we will see that later on. But uh, a router could also be used to uh, connect two uh, LANs, uh, bridge could also be used to connect two LANs locally. So, both are store and for, so we will just see a quick comparison now uh, for this, 
both are uh, store and forward uh, devices. Routers network layer devices examine network layer headers, bridges are link layer devices. So, that is a difference. Routers maintain routing tables implement routing algorithms, bridges maintain bridge tables implement filtering learning and spanning tree algorithm. So, uh, bridges uh, maintain sta bridge tables consisting of MAC addresses, routers maintain routing tables consisting of IP addresses. Uh, the, it implements routing algorithm how that is uh, uh, I mean what their routing algorithms are etc. We will see later on what its advantage disadvantage etc. But uh, they are a different class of algorithms. This use some filtering and learning for the addresses and a spanning tree algorithm. Okay. So, this is uh, this thing suppose from a host if these are the uh, layers in the protocol stack. So, from the higher layer may be from layer 5 it is coming down to 4, 3, 2, 1. 1 if you remember is the physical layer. So, from the physical layer it travels from 1 to 1. Then since bridge is a layer 2 device, so it goes only up to layer 2. Suppose this is going from here to here. So, there is a long um, I mean 3 hops away. So, it goes only up to layer 2. Then it encounters a router in the next hop and router will go take it up to layer 3 and then again bring it back and then send it to the host which will again now go to layer 5. Okay. So, this is a bridge is a layer 2 device, router is a layer 3 device. Routers versus bridges to, to continue that <coughs> bridges uh, plus and minus what are the advantages and disadvantages of a bridge. Advantage bridge operation is simpler requiring less packet processing, bridge tables are self learning you do not have to do any configuration. Now, all traffic confined to spanning tree even when alternative bandwidth is available. Okay. So, this is a negative point you remember uh, that we made we disabled some of the uh, this thing. Of course, uh, we run, run the spanning tree algorithm from time to time if one of the uh, link fails uh, if you run it again then something as a link which was previously disabled might become enabled now that is all right. But uh, forgetting about failure for the time being. So, we are using only some of the links while some other links we are not using at all. So, that is actually wasted bandwidth. So, we are not uh, using this uh, um, or, or the total bandwidth that is available for us to its fullest extent. So, that is a negative point we are using some of the edges and bridges do not offer protection from broadcast storms. Okay. So, this is uh, another uh, point um, negative point. Routers plus and minus are plus is arbitrary topologies can be supported uh, uh, which means that uh, specifically cycles can be supported. In bridges we saw that bridges may sort of make a frame go on and on forever, but in the network layer uh, what would happen is even if such a thing happens through its distributed algorithm because due to some flaw or the other etcetera if a packet starts cycling what will happen is that the protocol is such that at each hop each packets uh, uh, packet will have a counter and that counter will be decremented and if some router finds that this uh, uh, count has become 0 it will simply drop it. So, there is a time to live in that packet. So, the packet cannot circulate indefinitely. So, so it is limited by TTL count counters and of course, if you have good routing protocols such cycles will be uh, less to start with. So, now since this uh, so these arbitrary topologies can be supported not just a tree. So, the uh, network throughput may become better, P it will provide protection against broadcast storms because if, uh, if there is a this thing coming from some other IP uh, network uh, then it may not it will uh, it may not uh, allow the broadcast. Require IP address configuration which means that it is not a plug and play anymore it requires a manual configuration and requires higher. Uh, packet processing. It requires more processing. Uh, so, and naturally uh, for that reason they are also costlier. Uh, bridges do well in small that means few hundred hosts while uh, routers are used in large networks thousands of hosts. Now, for similar networks for example, Ethernet modern switches can be configured to do some bridging function. So, whatever functionality we said uh, are there in the bridge 
they are also there in uh, um, uh, modern switches. So, uh, uh, it makes sense to compu uh, compare switches and bridges and switches and routers also. So, just to compute uh, I mean compare between switch versus routers, um, switches are fast very fast, routers are slow. Okay. So, switches are doing just that so switching. So, that uh, that is uh, got very special hardware for that. Uh, so, that can be done very fast whereas, router has to do some computation. So, it is a, a relatively slow. Switches are inexpensive, routers are expensive. Switches do not give you this benefit of alternative routing that means, alternative paths uh, for this um, same source destination pair whereas, benefits of alternative routing are there. There is no uh, question of hierarchical addressing, um, but hierarchical addressing are possible with routers. What are hierarchical addressing etcetera, we will discuss that later on. So, but, uh, but remember once again that when we are you are connected to the wide area network to the whole wide world, uh, then routers is a must because other people are also connect through routers and these routers will only talk to each other. So, a switch will not talk to that, but if you are trying to do local internet networking a bridge or a switch which nowadays gives all the bridging functions that may be a good and cheap alternative and also much faster alternative. So, switch where you can and route where you must. And this is uh, finally, a summary uh, comparison between uh, hubs, bridges, switches and routers, traffic isolation, uh, hubs uh, do not give any traffic isolation, bridges yes, routers yes, switches yes. So, the, uh, the hub you know is a just, a, uh, just a shared medium, so that does not give any isolation at all. Plug and play of course, hub will also be a plug and play, bridges will be a plug and play, switches will be a plug and play, but routers need some configuration. So, this is not a plug and play. Optimal routing, hubs do not know about routing. So, there is no question, there is no question of any routing, this is just one shared medium. Uh, uh, bridges cannot do that either uh, or switches cannot do that either. So, they will uh, sort of uh, switch would usually be configured in a certain way, we will come to that. Uh, routers can uh, find the optimal route at any particular point of time because remember things are always changing in a network. Cut through that is cut through means that uh, you start transmitting as the bits arrive uh, hubs uh, can, uh, of course yes because uh, hub is a uh, that way is a replacement of a passive shared medium. So, whatever bit comes it goes everywhere. So, uh, so cut through is yes in that sense. Switches of course, al could also be a cut through that means, it uh, may, may as soon as it gets a bit it may forward it whereas, bridges and routers have to wait for the whole thing and then uh, inspect it uh, through some routing table or bridging table. So, they are not cut through. And finally, we talk about virtual LANs <coughs> which is partition and extended LAN to logically separate LANs VLANs. So, this each VLAN is assigned a color identifier and packets are only forwarded to VLANs of the same color. So, now we can use a bridge and as I said that nowadays this uh, the we could have switches also and in the switch the different ports of a switch could be different VLANs. Please note that if you have such a thing then this port is belonging to one particular VLAN and this port is also belonging to the same particular VLAN. Although physically they are two different LAN segments logically they are in the same VLAN and logically these two are in the same VLAN. So, it might happen is that suppose you are uh, say you know, in one building computer science is in three different floors and the same floors are three different floors are also shared by uh, the um, say the electrical engineering department each floor has a switch. Now, the computer science of floor 2 and floor 1 and floor 0 uh, they could be in the same VLAN. So, they are in the one group logical group and these could be in another logical group. Uh, so, that way you could configure your VLAN. Of course, this needs manual configuration, but this is possible. So, why are VLAN so popular today? One is scalability because broadcasts are now getting limited because of this security and then network management decouple physical topology from the logical topology. As I said that the uh, although uh, two different uh, it could be in two different LAN segments could be in the same VLAN all right. 
So, suppose that a land segment at CCB is uh, to be switched to COC administration or something, okay, any kind of example you can think of. So, we have now finished our uh, discussion on uh, inter local internet networking. Next, we will see some other emerging uh, and um, technologies which are very becoming very important once again in the same uh, data link business which is the wireless technology. Okay. Thank you. Good day. So, uh, now we will start our discussion on terrestrial wireless network. Okay. We have already seen one kind of uh, wireless uh, uh, communication which is through satellite. Okay. So, it is a microwave repeater and we know that, but uh, and now there are two very important and uh, uh, I mean rapidly expanding uh, field in networking which is terrestrial wireless networking. So, we will have two lectures on this. The, in the first lecture, we will discuss cellular networks, okay, the cell phones which has become ubiquitous nowadays and in the next lecture, we will talk about wireless LANs, okay, wireless LANs and maybe a little bit of wireless MANs also. So, today we will so talk about cellular networks. So, just uh, right uh, away, let us uh, learn some jargons. Okay. What is a, a cell? Because the cellular network, uh, so a network is uh, organized in the form of some cells. So, what is a cell? It covers a geographical region. Okay. It has a base station analogous to 802.11 AP. Uh, AP is for access point. 802.11 is the wireless uh, LAN technology. We will discuss this in the next lecture. Anyway, the point is that there is a base station. So, this is a let us say the uh, uh, indicating a base station. Base station will have an antenna over there and some transmitter receiver of course and it will be connected to the backbone through, um, uh, through a line. Maybe the, this could also be a, a wireless line, but usually this would be a fiber optic line. Okay, that is what people prefer. And when this uh, transmitter, so whatever mobile, suppose we take uh, this particular um, base station. So, whatever mobile uh, stations, mobile users, so these are the mobile handsets let us say are in a certain geographical location around this base station will communicate with this base station and through this base station to the rest of the network. So, mobile users attach to network through BS and air interface is the physical and link layer protocol between mobile and BS. So, this is an air interface between this mobile that is called an air interface between this mobile and the base station. Now, all these base stations are uh, sort of uh, they, they get connected to some mobile switching center. So, the switching is essentially done over here. So, connect cells to wide area net and of course, this uh, MSC. So, mobile switching center is an MSC. Uh, 